Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. It's Thursday. We're almost through the week. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm Zandra, the community manager for Charmverse and your host for the Twitter space. If you're not familiar with Charmverse, you should definitely check it out. We are a Web3 community platform to help you manage members, coordinate tasks, facilitate decisions, and really just hold each other accountable. Uh, members can sign in with crypto wallets and gain access via community tokens and NFTs. And it brings together onboarding, payment management, proposals, project trackers, and data repositories all in one place. So again, please check it out after the space. But for now, I would love to introduce you to Chris, founder of Topple. Hey, Chris, how are you? Good to be here with you, Zandra. I'm doing well today. Where are you calling from? Calling in from Austin, nice. Texas. Is it warm there? Um, it is warm. We had some not great weather last week, but uh, the sun's peeking out today. So no complaints I for a March. I love it. Yeah, it's starting to warm up. I'm actually in Maine. It's starting to warm up. It's a little rainy, but it's starting to feel like spring, and I'm pretty excited about it. So feeling good about it. So really excited to introduce Topple to our listeners if they're not familiar. Um, so listeners, Topple is the world's first blockchain designed to be an impact monetization engine. And of course, we're going to dig into that. So Chris, break that down for us. What does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. So really looking at that idea of impact monetization, what, what that means to me and what that means to Topple is how can we make positive impact? How can we make environmental sustainability economically sustainable and economically profitable? Uh, when I came into the international development, sustainable development space about half a dozen years ago, this was really one of the first concepts that I was introduced to that everyone you know, in that space is just so engaged in and so interested in right now. How can we take all these initiatives to create more inclusive development or better wages and supply chains or regenerative finance? Like, how can we make those things profitable and how can we make those things economically attractive? And that is what we are trying to do. That's what we're trying to power at Topple. You know, like making purpose profitable is another way that we sometimes say it. I love that. I think, you know, sustainability is such a big topic. We need more of it in Web3. So very much appreciate what you're doing and definitely excited to continue talking about um, this with you today. So when we talk impact, I think if you're in Web3, you hear about impact DAOs, impact communities. Really what we're talking about is people trying to do good for the world, essentially, to break it down in pretty simple terms, right? Yeah, absolutely. It comes in, you know, many flavors, many types of organizations, but yeah, good for the world, building good. That's exactly okay, how we fantastic. think about it. fantastic. We're on the same page already. So who doesn't want that, right? <laughs> who doesn't want more positive impact for the world that obviously we're dealing with climate change and um, just less equitable situations. So the more positive impact we can do um, in this new-ish industry, the better. So what would you say is the biggest problem in block te blockchain technology today, as most of us know it? If we're not topple aside, right? In blockchain technology, as we know it, what are some of the, the biggest problems we're seeing? So I think a lot of the problems that we're seeing are all kind of resulting in the same bigger problem, which is we've gotten very, very good at building things for ourselves. Right. I think we've gotten really good at building crypto projects, building tools, you know, applications, whatever we want to call them for the people that are already evangelized. I think we're really good at, you know, building, you know, to put it maybe a little bit negatively, we're kind of really good at building in our echo chamber. I don't think we are always the best at focusing our decisions, focusing the choices that we make on how can we bring in people to Web3 and how can we just use the power of the technology to deliver some value, some purpose, some benefit that like isn't just kind of like crypto trading or crypto price speculation, like evangelizing. Um, I think we've really gotten good, again, like building for ourselves, probably need to do a bit more introspection, a bit more focus on how to just like deliver the technology to people that have problems and like just need the solution, but don't necessarily need to fall in love with all things crypto. 
I think that is very well said. I think the people that are already here are excited about Web3 and invested in Web3. Um, and I think you're right. I think a lot of people are focused on building for those people. What do those people need? But how do we get more people into Web2? How do we onboard these people in, I don't know, a simplified way? Not everyone wants to have to sign up for that wallet and jump through those hoops, right? We want to try to make it easy for people um, and keep those newcomers in mind. And sustainability should definitely be focused on as well, because I think Web3 and specifically blockchain technology has kind of been, wait, this is a little uh, overstating, I don't know, but considered almost like an enemy of sustainability from what we heard in the first years, right? It's been known as an industry that's responsible for an oh, excess yeah. of uh, carbon dioxide and, and like creating or emitting, you know, more carbon dioxide than some of like the largest coal plants, you know? So like, that's really Never. scary. And I think that makes people maybe anti web three, web three skeptics, however you want to say it. So that's also why I'm really excited to bring you and topple into the discussion today, because it doesn't have to be that way. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, we've got, you know, a bit of, you know, we've got perception problems and that, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, oh, those negative headlines they catch, you know, whether they're negative headlines about, you know, money being stolen out of a crypto bridge or, yeah, whatever that, you know, that electricity or that CO2 emissions tracker is, whatever it is. Bitcoin's now like the size of Germany um, or some country thereabouts in terms of its emissions. Yeah, those those headlines catch. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, groups like ours, you know, a lot of other refi projects as well, we really are trying to put out a, a more positive narrative and really a narrative that is just around the benefits of the technology for problems that people do recognize, right? You, you know, when we're having these refi conversations or when we are onboarding like new carbon projects. So for example, we work with a lot of groups that are building new marketplaces or exchanges for carbon credits or groups that are interested in issuing carbon credits for the things that they're already doing. You know, our pitch isn't around crypto trading. It's not around crypto. It's around just the benefits of the technology. And, you know, so many people miss that, right? Because it's not as it's not as flashy of a headline, but you can really just dive in with people and, and explain and unpack for them like you have this problem maybe it's a problem around transparency or maybe it's this problem around like interoperability amongst your different data systems or you know this problem of just like the settlement and the speed at which you can execute trades and all the value props that we're talking about all the benefits that we're pitching are just like those technology benefits like you have you have a problem you have a problem that's standing in the way of your impact initiative Maybe this is the technology that that can help solve that. I think that's a pretty flashy headline and would get my attention. Um, I think that's great. So tell us, okay, so how is Topple more energy efficient? How are you changing things? Yeah, so I mean, energy efficiency, I, I think this is like one of the big areas that that we as an entire crypto space have like kind of undersold ourselves because you really in a lot of ways like every new blockchain that not every but almost every new blockchain that's come out in the past five years you know we don't we don't choose proof of work anymore if someone's building a new web3 project the the default system has flipped over to proof of stake right so we're not running mining we're not running those big data centers anymore everyone is able to do that that exact level of security sometimes maybe a bit less sometimes maybe even a bit more security, we're all able to do that economically now. And I think it's kind of amazing that we've started making that flip five years ago as crypto, just moving from proof of work to proof of stake. And we're still fighting this narrative. Um, and I mean, we're, you know, we're working on that, you know, other projects, Algorand, Avalanche, Polygon, we're all, you know, out there trying to inform and educate people that, Bitcoin is not everything and Bitcoin is, you know, in a lot of ways like a dinosaur in the Web3 space, a super, super important uh, dinosaur and the one that kicked it all off, but definitely does not represent, uh, you know, where the engineering is today. Um, and I think Topple is definitely active in that space, but, you know, by no means are we the only ones. I'd say for us, the bigger focus has been dealing with 
kind of a secondary problem that I expect the the space will probably get some heat on as you know as we come into the coming months and years is around like the economic centralization and just like the level of concentration of wealth that exists in in a lot of these projects. So building a blockchain that is energy efficient, pretty easy. Building a blockchain that is energy efficient, but also more inclusive or has like a better distribution of its ownership, that's the trickier part. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because I feel like, and I could be wrong, um, but I feel like when the merge happened, oftentimes, or at that point, we were talking about like, oh, we're we're becoming more energy efficient. But you're saying this has been being worked on for years now. But you're right. This this isn't what's in the headlines. It really is kind of the more negative side of things. So I'm glad that you're clarifying that, that like th- this has been a problem blockchains have been working on for a while. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember, you know, being around in the Ethereum community before mainnet even launched and there were already plans and already discussions you know prior to the uh, first version of the network launching as to what the proof of stake transition was going to to look like there was actually even built in for for anyone who's unfamiliar with it there was this idea of an ice age um in ethereum and it was going to be the mechanism by which we kind of forced the network to go from proof of work over into proof of stake and you know, just because everything in engineering always takes a bit longer than is planned, that had to be like delayed a couple of times. So that was that transition into proof of stake was, you know, literally planned for and literally acknowledged in, you know, in the earliest conversations around Ethereum. I'm yeah, like I said, I'm glad that you're um, that you're mentioning that because I guess I wasn't totally aware of that, and I'm sure some of our listeners were definitely not aware of that. So that's great to hear. Um, so. I want to dive into the other part you were talking about, which was like it, the inclusivity. Um, but first, so Topple is a layer zero blockchain. So oftentimes you hear L1, L2. What does L0, or layer zero mean? So layer zero for us, at least, and, you know, crypto is a new space, moves very quickly. We don't always agree on our terms. But for us being an L0 means that we are... We have a consensus protocol. We have like a settlement layer that everything ultimately boils down to, but we can support multiple different ledgers or multiple different, um, you know, even smart contract virtual machines all running inside the same ecosystem. So, you know, other projects that, at least by our definition, we would consider other L0s. So Avalanche is, in a lot of ways, we think an L0 because it has the idea of subnets. You can kind of create your own little blockchain attached to the main Avalanche chain or Polkadot can be thought of, at least on our definition of an L0, because you have those parachains and those relay chains and even the Cosmos ecosystem with the the messaging protocol that they have to allow their different blockchains to talk to each other. Um, We think that represents an L0 as well. Really, we're just trying to acknowledge the fact that you need, you kind of need a bit of heft or you need kind of like a single unified token ecosystem to provide security for a blockchain. But that doesn't mean Every, you know, everyone needs to be writing their smart contracts in the same exact language or something like that. And it allows for a bit of diversity inside your blockchain ecosystem. Cool. All right. Thanks for breaking that down. Um, so Topple is a layer zero blockchain that's built to drive sustainable and inclusive growth. So we we're talking about inclusivity. How are you doing this? What does that look like? So I'd say what that looks like for us is it takes form in the projects and kind of in the groups that we work with and support, but then also takes a form in the in the design of the protocol itself. So, you know, to give you an example on, on like the application side or the use case side, a lot of Topple's early work, uh, we focused on supply chains, actually. We found supply chains to be both, you know, really a, a pretty powerful use case for blockchain technology in particular, but also really an ideal like bootstrapping mechanism back to that idea of how to get adoption, how to branch out of the Web3 echo chamber and get to to new areas. 
is one of the things that we discovered with supply chains is you can bring on supply chains and you can sell the idea of Web3 and blockchain to one supply chain at a time, right? So many crypto and so many Web3 use cases are fundamentally marketplace-based. And whenever we're dealing with the marketplace, you've got like that, that double-sided problem of you can't attract buyers until you have sellers and you can't attract sellers until you have buyers. And, you know, bootstrapping or setting all that up is, is a pretty big go-to-market or pretty just big... Um, like startup challenge, so to speak. And supply chains avoid that because you can sell the idea and you can provide the value of greater transparency or of like the immutability of data that can be provided for, for the supply chain information. You can provide that and you can roll that out one supply chain at a time. So that was really one of the areas that, that Tobles technology first started being used and first started getting traction. For us, inclusion and inclusivity in, in those use cases was really all about how can we get down to the first mile? Um, the first mile in supply chains, meaning to, to the actual mine sites and the individual miners, if we're talking about something like diamond or gold, or if down to like the farming cooperatives and individual farmers, if we're dealing with cacao or tea or coffee, like how can we actually get the technology and how can we actually get the the data capture that everyone's interested in down to that to that first mile level. And so for us, that was a lot about, can we integrate the technology with SMS? So we don't have people needing to like manage crypto wallets and crypto keys, but can they actually just submit data and review data via SMS instead? Or for us, it was about saying, how can we design a system that has like kind of very, very simplified, very accessible multi-party sign-off. So for example, some of the work that we did was around helping buyers, helping retailers verify that fair wages and living wages were being paid in, in the case of coffee supply chains. We did a lot of work there. And there was this problem that obviously the big companies in those supply chains would like claim Right, they would just say they were paying fair wages and living wages, even if it wasn't true, because they were the ones being asked. So we had to start devising systems so that individual farmers could actually certify that information or also share that information. So for us, that idea of inclusion was really about getting down to the first mile. When it comes to like the design of Topple itself and how can we make that more inclusive? we've actually tapped into a lot of the ideas and a lot of the research that was spearheaded over the years by the group Radical Exchange. So if anyone is familiar with the idea of quadratic voting or quadratic funding, um, these are new ideas in like political theory or new ideas in economics as to how we can better finance public goods and how we can kind of weight decision-making or weight funding decisions towards, you know, smaller individual contributors and away from, you know, bigger whales or things like that. And we've taken a lot of those uh, radical exchange ideas into how the topples tokenomics works and how topples governance works. So cool. Um, I You mentioned the coffee thing, and I really, I want to give people some more like concrete examples of what they can do um, or how, how it works, mm -hmm. right? So some examples that I saw so coffee, you mentioned making sure free wages are there. Another interesting one was conflict-free diamonds. Yeah. Um, so we've done conflict-free diamonds, conflict-free gold, this, uh, you know, very similar principles of you're making the data immutable on the blockchain so it can never be tampered with or cleaned up after the fact, but you're also extending, you know, the data capture, you're extending who you're asking these questions to down to the individual miner level or you know the individual trader level and you're getting away from you know just those very large groups who have the incentive to misreport this information so yeah conflict free diamonds conflict free gold are other areas um you know carbon credits are another i think pretty tangible example that is really just an area like actually completely outside of web3 and blockchain that is going through so much innovation and so much disruption right now, there's a real interest and there's a real drive to improve the way that we we measure carbon or the types of carbon instruments and 
you know, carbon trading structures that we have. And, you know, all of that is just being led by climate scientists and statisticians. But these new methodologies, these new carbon players, then like they need an infrastructure or, you know, they're not necessarily interested in building out their own registries or building out their own exchanges. And so some of them have started partnering either with Topple or with other players in the space to say, like, can we just do our are trading on a blockchain, or can we just use blockchain technology as registries? Um, you know, kind of as the the database where we store these new carbon credits, so so we don't also have to be our own technology companies. And this kind of leads to the monetizing impact when we talk about carbon, right? So yeah, um, that is yeah the golden example of it. So your carbon can be like tracked, tokenized and transacted yes ex exactly that and but this idea of of kind of carbon credits and turning uh, turning some form of impact into this quantifiable tokenizable monetizable unit we think can and should be applicable outside of the carbon space so we've actually started working with um about 10 different NGOs and social enterprises around tokenizing non-carbon impact. So obviously impact comes in many, many forms. We have, you know, public health related projects, or we have gender equity related projects, or we have, you know, biodiversity projects, which aren't necessarily about capturing more carbon, but protecting biodiversity in, you know, in certain key ecosystems around the world. And we're asking the question together with these partners of how can we turn their impact into tokens and how can we help them monetize that, that those other forms of impact beyond just carbon? I love this. I'm, lear I'm already learning so much. I love this. Um, I want to go backwards for one second because something, um, one of the projects, impact projects that you had worked with, and I feel like this affected everyone, so I just want to give you a shout out for this, was um, COVID-19 test kits um, was another thing that you partnered with as far as, um, yeah, just kind of helping that transparency, right? So where was that? Like, how did that fall in? Was it the results of these? What was it? Yeah, so, so so where that fell in is that fell in actually, it's kind of weird. It was a, a locally based partnership, which was kind of a weird thing to be doing when, when everything was remote, everything was virtual. But we partnered with another Austin-based technology provider who does a lot of work in the healthcare space. And what they were being tasked with by some of their partners is there was a big spoilage problem in, in the supply chain as everyone was trying to get COVID-19 test kits shipped around the world. Because what I didn't know at the time, and I didn't really learn and understand until we were engaged in this project, is the test kits, or at least a lot of the early forms of them, were very temperature sensitive, meaning that if it got too hot or if it got too cold anywhere along the supply chain, these test kits, when they would like arrive on site, they wouldn't be accurate anymore. They would give false readings. So it was very important that we were able to track and properly attribute if, when, and you know, if and when uh, temperatures got too hot or too cold, and we needed somewhere neutral, we needed somewhere credible, we needed somewhere immutable and tamper proof that this data could be stored so that all the different supply chain partners could really agree and figure out who was at fault. And even so, insurance payouts could be managed properly um, because all these supply chains are insured, but you can only actually collect on those insurance claims if, if you can make the report, if you can argue you know, what went wrong and whose responsibility it was at the time. So we learned a ton about you know, cold chains, healthcare supply chains during that process. But it was, yeah, I think a very tangible um, way that Topple does a lot of impact things, but usually a lot of us aren't directly affected by them. But I think this is a great example of that. Yeah. Do you think the knowledge you gained from that specific experience will help you maybe get more involved in like, I don't know, say the DSI space? 
I think so. And I think in a lot of ways, this is this has kind of been what Topple is always focused on. We we kind of made a unique decision relatively early on in our history to start working with projects as quickly as possible. So for you know, for anyone who may not know, Topple actually hasn't even gone through its own TGE yet. We haven't listed our token, we haven't flipped on, you know staking for for the community. We haven't flipped on community governance yet. Um, those things will all be coming later this year. So really, in a lot of ways, we are pre-launch, but we've always prioritized getting those use cases out there, getting those early experiments being done, because like there's only so many things we can possibly imagine, or there's only so many questions that you can answer just standing standing at the whiteboard. Yeah, you know, we we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot through through the COVID project and kind of know how to, I think, now better apply the technology to maybe pharmaceutical or maybe, you know, scientific data use cases going forward. We've learned a lot from from our early carbon work. Um, and so we now know how better to deal with with carbon space and even the energy space. We've learned a lot just because there's a very strong nexus that exists between um, energy, the energy transition, and decarbonization. So, you know, I'd say in a lot of ways, this is another thing that we looked into the Web3 space and kind of found lacking that, you know, we're really, really good back to that earlier point of building in echo chambers. As a space, we're also really good about just like going off into our offices or, you know, getting heads down at our desks and, and building something. Sometimes we kind of forget to um, actually kind of validate that out in the market. I think that's a good point. You know, go see what's actually happening out there. And and uh, things are always changing so quickly, which is why I was thinking about the DSI space. I actually just hosted um, Twitter space yesterday uh, with a DSI panel. And it's pretty fascinating what's happening in that world. Um, so I, it would just make sense for Topple to also, you know, start venturing that way. Uh, how long has yeah. Topple been around? So Topple, we got our start very, very, I'd say slowly and cautiously in, you know, in 2017, 2018. But really, we only got going, I'd say, closer to 2019, 2020 um, is so, you know, let's say about five years old by most meaningful metrics. So we've been around for a while. Um, and yeah, seen a lot of things, learned a lot of things along the way. A lot has happened in that time. <laughs> oh, yes, it has. <laughs> um, so, it, like, I guess if you were telling, you know, pitching Topple, why Topple? What makes this blockchain so special? I mean, obviously, you're designed for impact. But what are some of the other talking points you would go directly to as far as Topple? So the things that we really go to when when talking about Topple is we really do spend a lot of time on this idea of being purpose built, of being, you know, kind of focused around this, this thesis of impact, because, you know, there is no technology that is fully general purpose, right? You're always making trade-offs, you're always choosing this over that or that over this, and and nothing's ever perfect. And what we've really found in the refi space or what we've really found with, you know, a lot of the global south and emerging, mar emerging market partners we work with is there's just this incredible resonance and incredible excitement when these groups that are usually so neglected by technologists in general and technology companies actually find something that is, is built for them, prioritizes them, et cetera. So, you know, that really is a big area for us. But beyond that, we have... You know, we've put a lot of effort into the like the usable security of of how Topple handles smart contracts, of how Topple handles data. Um, so this was, you know, an area that that took a lot of research on our part, and you know, I think we really, in a lot of ways, led to a pretty innovative solution. Topple, the way our smart contracts work is that we actually run smart contracts only as um, as a layer two or you know all of all top of smart contracts are basically l2 smart contracts now what does that mean what that means for us is our smart contracts can be run locally so in any of like the the enterprise things that we're doing or anytime anyone like really worries about how sensitive their data is you know smart contracts can run locally or smart contracts can simply be run at a much lower cost because they're you know as we kind of 
maybe all know or maybe are a bit familiar with L2s, L2 costs are typically a lot lower than, than L1 costs. So smart contracts can be more secure because they're local or smart contracts can be cheaper to run because they're at an L2. We think that's um, a fairly interesting differentiator. And then there's been a lot of research done on our tokenomics, I would say as well in that Topple has a, one of the first ever, at least to our knowledge, semi-stable coins um, that will be in existence. So Topple put a lot of work into really reimagining how payments are handled in our network and kind of shying away from or turning away from the idea of like pegged stable coins that need to maintain perfect one-to-one -one ratios with another currency, just towards this idea of like asking the question, well, what if a blockchain was kind of like a country and countries have currency and those currencies need to be somewhat stable, but they still can move around. Currencies aren't usually pegged to each other and kind of replicating that thinking in the, in the payment vehicle for a top of blockchain, which we also think is quite unique. Yeah, thanks. I definitely think uh, that's kind of what I was getting at. You, you nailed it as far as the data <laughs> and, you know, verifications of the relevant data and stuff like that. So thank you. So what inspired you to create Topple? And when did you kind of first decide to get into this world? I guess also, what were you doing before this? Three questions, so, throwing those all at you. All right, I will figure <laughs> out a way to sort through that. Um, so I, I've been in Web3 in, in one form or another. I kind of fell down that rabbit hole actually all the way back in 2011, 2012. Um, so I was, I was back in college still at the time, and I had some friends that were really into Bitcoin and everything like that. And they kind of hooked me in, to be honest. So dabbled in the space casually as I was finishing up university. And then as I was coming out of university, I started my first startup in the Web3 space. Much more on the on the pure fintech side, we were doing, uh, we built out a platform and a mobile application to handle payments paired with a customer loyalty, customer engagement platform that we were marketing to local businesses, food trucks, coffee shops, um, everything like that. And I did that for, for about two or three years and learned a couple of really important lessons before selling off, uh, selling off the intellectual property, selling off of everything that we did for that. The first lesson that, that I learned was there are a lot of use cases of blockchain or there are a lot of things that you can do that are they're kind of neat they're cool they're they're interesting but they're not super valuable so kind of learn the difference between i think shiny and problem solving or shiny and valuable during that process the other thing i learned was just how challenging it can be to build out on top of a technology that is maybe not built with your exact use case in mind or is still going through a lot of its changes. So the application and the, the platform that we built back then was built on a very, very early version of Ethereum. And I definitely have the battle scars to prove just how hard it was to work with that technology in the early days. And you know just how much this idea of real world or rather physical world retail payments was not a use case that the Ethereum had prioritized. And so, so coming out of that, I had made a lot of connections, incidentally enough, into different development banks and different UN agencies that were ex starting to experiment with and starting to explore the potential of crypto and of blockchain technology to sustainable finance or to uh, multilateral finance where, you know, loans or different development programs would be offered to to Global South countries and Global South economies. And I was privileged enough to be a part of a lot of those early working groups that were being done at the UN, at the World Bank, et cetera. And I really just got an appetite for how much potential there was at the intersection of, of blockchain and impact and how I really did just feel it was a space that was that was under addressed in a lot of ways. It just wasn't a focus of of any crypto or any Web3 discussions that I was having, you know, on Twitter or Reddit, things like that. So, so we went out and we built a blockchain for that purpose. And you're crushing it. <laughs> Doing our best. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're <laughs> learning as you go, as we all are, and kind of figuring it out along the way. And and I love it. So 
between refi, building sustainable blockchains, and just creating new systems that are more accessible and inclusive, what are you most excited about for the future of Web3, how sustainability fits into it, just in general? What are you kind of geeking out on and most excited about? I, I think what I'm most excited about is, is I'm waiting for the renaissance of DAOs and governance. And so in a lot of ways, in crypto or in Web3, what goes around comes around. And before any big wave that we've ever had, whether it's NFTs or, or DeFi or proof of stake, there, there's always like this, this false start or this early example that kind of catches fire, but then everyone forgets about it. And it goes dormant for a couple of years until everyone rediscovers it again, right? You know, NFTs were, were a big thing for most people only in the past two years. But, but I remember thinking back to, to whatever it was, 2016, 2017, when CryptoKitties first came out or, you know, DeFi summer was in 2022 or sorry, 2020, but Maker and kind of that first ever DeFi stablecoin project goes back to the earliest days of Ethereum. And so while I think we've seen some experimentation and some early use cases for, for DAOs and for community voting, I don't think we have seen nearly what we are going to see and nearly the kind of the Cambrian explosion of experimentation there that, that I'm hoping and expecting we'll see probably in the next 18 months to two years. Um, I think blockchains are just such an, such an ideal and such an exciting playground for us to experiment with new models of human and new models of like economic coordination and cooperation. And like, that's what I'm super excited about is, you know, innovations in governance, innovations in community decision-making that, again, 18, 24 months, really hoping to see a lot there. Yeah, I look forward to kind of keeping an eye on all of this. Listeners, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand and we can bring you up on stage to ask Chris any questions you have about these topics. Um, and let's see. So, oh, as a founder. Speaking to future founders that are listening, what is a must do in your opinion? Something you feel you did that you did right and you would suggest other people do? So at least for me, um, and I, I know founders for whom this isn't the case, so you know, let's take this all with a grain of salt. But for me, doing something in which I find purpose is absolutely critical. Um, you know, in there are so many ways being a founder is, is fun. It's exciting. It's incredibly flexible sometimes, but there are also a lot of challenges. There is a lot of uncertainty and self doubt that, that can go into that. And for me, what's always gotten me through those, those most challenging times of being a founder and of an entrepreneur is I look at this and I can recognize and I can remind myself that there is there's a reason that I'm doing this. There's a purpose that I'm doing this, that the world hopefully will be a better place if we succeed. Um, and that's really been something that's gotten me through, you know, you know challenges or, or blow ups or, you know, whatever number of crypto winter we're on um, right now. So, yeah, being able to find that purpose and have that purpose is is important. And I think the other thing is just learning to not wait for things to get more calm. Um, in a lot of ways, startups and you know entrepreneurial life, especially in a space like Web3, is the literal embodiment of, of chaos. And I found kind of my own mental health and my own just outlook really improved once I embraced that. I spent a lot of my early time as a founder like waiting to to raise our seed stage or waiting to then get to series A or waiting for whatever that milestone was going to be that was going to change things and make everything all better and all calm down. Um, then the other approach is just embrace it, accept it, and learn to enjoy it and um, stop fighting the chaos. I like that. I mean, being a founder from founders that I've spoken with, you know, it's not easy. Like you said, there are benefits. It's flexible. Um, you have a passion about what you're doing, so that's fantastic, but it's a lot and you are navigating a lot of chaos and yeah, just 
just start building and working your working your way through it and figuring it out as you go and stop waiting around. Um, yeah. I think that's great advice. How about something that you might not do again if you had a do over? Ooh. Founders, at least most of the founders I meet, myself included, were very, very ambitious. Um, I think there have definitely been times where I've tried to do too much too fast. And, you know, we would try to stand up another vertical or stand up another work stream or immediately start expanding into a second area before we really had our feet under ourselves in the first. Um you know, as as a founder, you feel like everything is like super, super urgent. And if you don't do this in the next 90 days, someone's going to beat you to it. And yeah, I mean, sometimes that definitely is the case. But there are also a lot of things that we kind of rushed or doubled up on doing that we made the decision to double up on them four years ago. And I still actually haven't seen anyone else bring that idea to market. So definitely some things we could have waited on and, you know, maybe taking it a bit more uh, one at a time. All right. Great advice. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that with all of us. Um, so as we wrap up, um, hold on, I thought, no. Okay. Um, as we wrap up, what is next for Topple? What's coming down the pipeline that you can share with us? Yeah, absolutely. So, so as I, as I alluded to Topple is, we're not yet decentralized. We haven't gone through our, our token generation or our token listing, anything like that, um, really because I was pretty active in the space during the ICO craze. And I just, I saw how hard that was. I saw projects of like five or six people where you would have to have four of them managing the Telegram chat, another person running around getting exchange listings, and you only had like one of your people that was able to actually move the project forward. Um, so I, I think I gained a healthy respect for the challenges of turning over to decentralization and token listing, everything like that. But that is finally the stage that Topple is at now. We've gone through a couple versions of our blockchain. We've locked down and developed, I think, really exciting tokenomics and governance models. And we will be going through our token generation event and turning ourselves over to DAO-based and community-based governance by the end of the year. Um, and we're starting to really stand up a community for that over in our Discord, over in a few other channels um, in advance of that. But yeah, people are getting interested in how to both build on Topple, but also to uh, take some stewardship in this you know, impact community, this impact protocol that we're building out. Um, the time for us to open the community doors will uh, be later this year. Amazing, very exciting. I look forward to following the journey of Topple. Um, listeners, so Topple is an impact technology economy that enables digital and sustainable transformation across value chains and empowers the monetization of impact verified on the Topple blockchain. Um, definitely check it out. Twitter, it's at Topple underscore protocol, and the website is topple.co. Please go check them out. Uh, click on Chris's PFP and give him a follow as well. They're doing super exciting things in the impact world, which at Charmverse, we love, of course. So showing all of our support. Chris, you've been a fantastic guest and very informative. I'm really excited about Topple and what you're doing over there. Thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope one day we get to meet in real life. And, um, and yeah, everyone, you change the world. Topple proves it. Go check it out. Amazing blockchain. Um, and let's all follow their journey together. So thanks again, Chris. And uh, yeah, I hope to talk again soon. Thanks again. Take care. Oh, one last shout out. Everyone, oh. I'm going to be writing a blog post in the coming weeks about this discussion we have and featuring Topple because like I said at Charmverse, we really love what they're doing. So keep an eye out for that on our Twitter page and all of our socials. Um, we'll be putting it out there soon. But yeah, extra support for Topple from us. And uh, yeah, keep crushing out there, Chris. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Bye.